Hello and welcome. My name is Nikita Batch and I'm the Education and Events Coordinator here at Victoria Law Foundation. I'm here today with David Thompson, our teacher in residence at the Foundation, and we will be chatting to you about topics specifically relating to Unit 1 of the Legal Studies curriculum to assist you in your learning of the VCE Legal Studies curriculum. My first question to you today, David, is can you please define and explain the principles of justice? The principles of justice, well, this is an important term because it appears in so much of the study design that runs right through units one, two, three, and four. It's broken down into three parts, but they're not really separate. The parts are interrelated. Fairness is the first of them. The second is equality, and the third is access. And what I'll do is go through each one of those in turn. To look at fairness first, fairness requires a fair process and a fair hearing. Parties should have the opportunity to know the case that's being put against them and to be able to present their case in response. So fairness requires a fair process and a fair hearing. The pre-hearing and the hearing itself, the trial, must be conducted reasonably and fairly. The second element is equality. And as remember what I said before, these are not separate. We look at them separately, but they are in fact over, they do in fact overlap, and you'll see that. Equality requires that all people be treated equally. All people. And it comes back to that old expression of the rule of law. There's one law for everybody. All people are treated equally before the law and given an opportunity to present their case, present their defence. No person should be treated advantageously or disadvantageously. The body that is hearing the accusation made against a particular person should ensure that the process is free from, from bias, free from prejudice, both, both ways. There should be no favourable treatment and there should be no unfavourable treatment. It should be equal. One thing that we're very lucky here in Australia is that our magistrates and judges have a history of impartiality. They're very good at remaining impartial to ensure that people do receive equal treatment. The law is applied equally and it reinforces the notion of the rule of law. It upholds the rule of law. And if equality is provided, if equality is uh, a key element, and it must be, then justice is done. The third element is access. Remember we started with fairness, we looked at equality, we're now looking at access. Access to the justice system requires more than being able to walk through your solicitor's door or through the doorway of the court. It requires that people understand their legal rights and the opportunities that they have to pursue those rights. Now this includes more than an ability to access the institutions that hear cases, as I said before. It means being able to approach bodies that provide three things, legal assistance, education and assistance, legal advice rather, legal advice, education and assistance. People should be able to receive information about their case, about the sorts of processes that it will go through and the possible outcomes. Parties should have the opportunity to make use of such processes within the justice system and that these are not beyond their reach. And that's very important, not beyond their reach. So it can't be such an expensive process that a person is completely unable to exercise their rights. So there we have access. They're the three again, fairness, equality and access. And they appear as the principles of justice throughout the units one, two, three and four. So you'll get very used to those when you're studying this subject. Thank you, David. Um, what is the difference between criminal and civil law? Now that is a big question. The main difference between civil and criminal law is the, is, is the outcomes. The, uh, the consequences of a person's behaviour. A crime is an offence against 
the whole society. And that's why the state prosecutes people for breaches of criminal law. Whereas the civil law, the a civil matter, is brought by the party whose legal rights have been infringed. So if you go and steal a car, that's treated as an offence against the whole of society, as well, of course, as the person who owned the motor car. But it's also, um, the, within the civil law, um, it might be possible to sue the person who's taken your car and smashed it up. So the civil right, the legal right has been breached and you may be able to bring an action that you being the person whose, whose rights have been infringed, the owner of the property whose property has been damaged, will initiate proceedings uh, against the person who has breached their civil rights. The purpose of the criminal law, it aims to, to punish offenders, essentially. If you're found guilty, you get punished. Purpose of civil law is to put people back into the position, the situation that they were in, before their rights were infringed. And this can be done in a number of ways. The most common way is what's called damages, and that means money, monetary compensation. The other way is an injunction. An injunction is a court order which compels someone to stop doing something. There can be injunctions that require people to do things, but the most usual form of an injunction is one which compels somebody to stop doing something or not to do it again. As I said before, the Crown brings an action or the state brings an action in criminal law. That's why a case will be um, cited as R and a little v and the surname of the accused. And we describe that as the Queen or the Crown or the Director of Public Prosecutions against the accused person. Whereas in civil law, the matter is brought by the plaintiff, that is the person who is bringing the action, the person who's claiming his or her um, legal rights have been infringed, that person brings the action against the defendant. So with criminal, it's the state against the accused. With civil law, it's the plaintiff, the wronged party, against the party who allegedly has committed the, the wrong. And that gives rise to different standards of proof. In criminal law, the standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. So a magistrate or a jury hearing a criminal case must reach their decision if they're going to find the person guilty or not guilty beyond reasonable doubt. In other words, they must be satisfied that there's no reasonable doubt to find a person guilty. There's no reasonable doubt that the person did do the wrong that is uh, charged against them, did commit the crime, in other words. Whereas at civil law, it's a slightly different standard. It's a lower standard. It's called on the balance of probabilities. And what, what that really means is that it is more probable than not. It's like, a, it's like a balance. It's more probable than not that the person did commit the wrong, did breach the civil rights, did breach the uh, legal rights of the, uh, the person who's bringing the action against that person. Now, in the magistrate's court, of course, there's no jury. In the magistrate's court, the jury has to find not only on questions of law, but on questions of fact as well. So a person appearing in a criminal proceeding in the magistrate's court, the magistrate will decide beyond reasonable doubt whether the accused is guilty or not. In a civil matter, juries aren't normally well, they're not in the magistrate's court at all, but in the county court and the supreme court, juries of six can be impanelled at the choice of either the plaintiff or the defendant, and they will be required to apply a, a lower standard of proof, and that, as I said before, is on the balance of probabilities. Now, in the criminal matters in the supreme and county, we have a jury of 12, and those 12 people are expected to reach a unanimous verdict. There are circumstances under which a jury um, may be permitted to return a finding of 11-1. Procedural differences, as I mentioned before, the state brings criminal proceedings, the wronged party brings civil proceedings. And the sanctions that can be imposed, as I mentioned right at the beginning of this, uh, this little component, um, normally, a person who commits a criminal offence and is found guilty will be sentenced to jail 
they may get a fine or both or a community corrections order, civil matters, damages, compensation, and as I mentioned before, they could also um, receive, there, an injunction could also be required to be handed down, or the, the court may hand down an injunction requiring a person not to repeat a particular form of behaviour or not um, breach the person's legal rights. Well, look at trespass trespassing on somebody's land, in, that, in those circumstances um, the order might be, an injunction might be, you're not allowed to go near that person's land or not allowed onto that person's land again. And that's the power of an injunction. If, of course if they breach an injunction then they're in serious trouble, it's back to court for, for more uh, treatment. <laughs>
And so Mr Hale decided that, uh, on the advice given, that he would sue the club, the league and the local council. Now it got into a bit of a, a, bit of a bun fight when it got to court because obviously the lad who was injured believed that the club, the league and the local council, who were responsible for the ground, had breached his legal rights that he had been the victim of their negligence. The club and the league both blamed each other and collectively they blamed the council. Now it went to court and ultimately, on the balance of probabilities, the court found that the, and this was a judge alone hearing, the court found in favour of the young lad who'd been injured and said that the club and the league and the council were all responsible, the council to a slightly lesser degree. And so an award of damages, and that's compensation, that's money, an award was made to young Mr Hale to put him back into the position that he was in prior to being injured in that match. Now that's fairly, a fairly common model of a civil matter. A matter is brought, it goes to court, not always, sometimes it'll be mediated and try to reach a solution before it goes to court. And that's, that's a fairly common practice, that sort of thing. But if it does go to court, then that's the procedure. Both sides give their evidence, both sides present their cases, and ultimately the, the court, be it a magistrate sitting alone, a judge sitting alone, or a judge sitting a jury with a jury, the decision is made in favour of either the plaintiff, that is the person bringing the action, or the defendant, the party, responding to that, uh, that claim that's made against them. Do you have study tips for us, David? I have some study tips, yes. I think the most important study tip is get a hold of a copy of the study design. Now, it's a new one. Don't get Big Brother or Big Sisters one from two years ago because it's out of date. The best thing to do is to get a copy yourself. Now you can down, download that from the VCAA, Victorian, uh, the Victorian Curriculum and Assessment Authority's website, uh, and just print off the whole thing. Print off the whole of the study design, units one, two, three, and four, because it'll give you a clear picture of how this course progresses, because quite a few of you, I imagine, are thinking of taking this right through until unit four. So get a copy of the study design. Why? Because you can only be examined on what is in the study design. If it's in the study design, you can be examined on it. If it's not in the study design, you can't. So right from day one, you'll know exactly what this course is going to cover. So it's very important to do that. Now, the second study tip is make good use of your teachers. That person up the front of the classroom is there to help you. If you don't know, ask. You don't have to ask in front of everybody else if you're embarrassed. Sidle up to them quietly at some point and ask your question. But it's really important not to think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll work that out later. It's very important that you, you ask if you're not sure about what's being done in class. Very important. And the third thing is making notes. It's very important that you make notes as you're going. Whether you're making your notes in the old-fashioned way, writing them down in a, in a notebook, or you're using a tablet or some other device, make sure that your notes are current. That is, write up your notes so that they are on what you're doing today. Don't leave them for a week or a month or whatever. It's important to be able to say, I've got all my notes, so when it does come time to some sort of assessment task, you can go back to them and you've got everything there in the right order and you're able to effectively carry out your re revision for whatever task you're being asked to do. And am I allowed a fourth tip? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Case notes. Over the course of legal studies, you're going to look at a number of cases. Now I have a little trick that I learnt, I, I didn't make it up, I was told this when I was a law student. To make case notes on four headings, under four headings, F-I-D-S, FIDS, Facts, Issues, Decision, Significance. 
The facts are obvious. Who did what to whom? In other words, what's the case about? The issues, what is going to have to be resolved by a court? What's going to have to be worked out? What's going to have to be sorted out by the court? The decision, who won? Was it the plaintiff or the defendant? The Crown? The accused? Who won? And the last one, S for significance, remember F-I-D-S, significance, is it a new precedent? Has the case made new law? And cases sometimes do that. So what's the significance? Why are we bothering to study this particular case? What's the point of it? It's obviously being studied for a reason. It contributes a piece of information to the area of the course that you're currently studying. But also, it can be where you can use it as an example. Now, there's no rule in VCE legal studies that says you can't use a case example in different areas of the, of the course. And that could be that you might, you might look at a case next week in, in VCE Legal Studies Unit 1 and you suddenly remember, oh, Unit 3. I've, you get to Unit 3 next year and you suddenly realise that you could use that case example. No reason why you can't. So if you've got your notes, when I was a law student I did them on a little bit of cardboard about the size of an envelope, but you can do them. You can record them in your device as well, any way you like, as long as you've got them. That's really important. Thank you so much for listening today. We hope you found this resource useful.